Well, you know, the greatest achievements in life, they usually don't happen overnight. They usually happen little by little. Roughly 600 years passed between the calling of Abraham and the covenant of Moses. And then another 400 years or so would pass between the Exodus and the inauguration of the Davidic covenant. And it was during that period of time that God put it into the heart and the mind of uh, David to build a temple for his own glory, but da- for, for God's own glory. But even David would not get to see the fulfillment of that dream in his lifetime. His son, Solomon would be the one that would have to pick up the torch and complete it around 957 BC. And we don't know exactly how long it took to build the first temple, uh, but we know that when that temple was then destroyed and subsequently rebuilt, that it took 46 years to rebuild it the second time. So the first construction had to have been a lot longer than that because some of the things like the foundation, a lot of that stuff was already laid. Uh, Another thousand years would pass between the kingdom of David and the men of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, even for the Bible, the greatest achievements happen little by little. But the same thing that's true for biblical history is also true for human history. Humankind's greatest achievements also didn't happen overnight. They happen little by little. Now, remarkably, the Colosseum in Rome is something that only took uh, somewhere between seven to eight years to complete. That's pretty amazing uh, when you think about that, especially considering that the new Ram Sophie Stadium took four years to build. And that's with all the marvels of modern day construction that we have and and things of that nature. Now, on the other hand, there are sections of California highways that have been under construction for 20 to 30 years with little to no sign of any progress. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about right now? I am specifically, when I'm saying this, mentioning the section of I-5 freeway north of Buena Park as you head into Los Angeles. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. When I moved here, uh, it was like almost 20 years ago when I was going into college. It was under construction at that time. And I was a young guy, so I'm sure it had been being worked on way, way, way before that. You know, here's what I'm trying to get at. Little by little, Los Angeles knows how to create unnecessary traffic jams, don't they? It took two years, two months, and five days to complete the Eiffel Tower. Today, the largest building in the world is in Dubai. It's the Burj Khalifa. And the Burj Khalifa took about six years to build. And many years before that, someone had to dream it. Someone had to design it. And then they had to fund it. LG recently announced that they were permanently pulling out of the smartphone business that they had spent the last 12 years building. And so what that means for me is that little by little, there will be no more green bubbles polluting my text message feed. Come on, iPhone users, you know what I'm talking about. Speaking of better devices, the iPhone (laughs) took two and a half years from concept to implementation uh, to build. But what about just like kind of basic life achievements? You know, even for those who never go to college, the average person spends 14 years in school. Now, if you go to college, you add another four to five, six, seven, however long it takes you to get through it to that. Uh, Lisa and I, my wife and I, we both tacked on master's degrees to the end. So uh, I was so proficient in my master's degree that it took me seven years to finish a two-year program. Uh, That's how fast I went through the whole thing. And the average doctor spends four years in school after college, and if they specialize, it's another four to six years of training with residency and all kinds of other things. Here's what I'm getting at. Little by little, we all learn what we need to learn to do whatever it is that God calls us to do. The average American today gets married somewhere around 30.5 years old. That's what the statistics say. And the average American today buys their first house at age 34 unless they live in Southern California. In which case they buy for the first time at age 74, spend two years fixing it up, and then they die. Some of you are like, oh man, you know I'm telling it like it is, right? Okay, so enough about life achievement facts and depressing you about when you can buy a house. Um, the, The point that I'm trying to get across is that every great achievement in everyone's life, in the Bible and in history, has always been accomplished little by little. 
And I'm gonna step out on a limb here for a second and say something that I think is probably true for many of you who are here today and many of you who are watching this at home or wherever you find yourself right now. And I have a feeling that there are many people who are feeling stuck in their life these days. You're frustrated by where you are. You see other people getting into places and positions and and doing things that you feel like you want to see happen in in your life that just aren't happening for you. And you feel like something is wrong with you. You feel like the things that you've been praying for just aren't going to happen. Man, I am just praying, if that is you today, that this message is like a lightning bolt from Jesus and the Holy Spirit to your heart. Um, And so my message title today is Little by Little. And so if you got a Bible, I want to ask everyone here to open a Bible to the book of Exodus chapter 23, and we're going to look at verses 20 through 33. Um, if you didn't bring one, grab your phone and find it on the YouVersion app. And to give you a little bit of context as you turn and swipe there, uh, sandwiched in the midst of like all these boring mosaic laws about the, you know, the temple and, and how sacrifices were to be made and, and all of this stuff, uh, is this little nugget of gold from God to Moses. Moses about how God does great things through ordinary people. You know, Christians like to talk about how God does great things, right? It's like, amen, God's great. You know, he does great things. But what I love about Exodus 23, specifically verse 30, is it tells us how God does great things through ordinary people. And it even throws this little phrase in there that you're going to see, little by little little. Now, of course, there are cataclysmic events in all of our lives and also in the Bible. But even in those, I would argue that there's a backstory that built up to those cataclysmic events that was a lot of little series of events. See, events are never isolated events in and of themselves. And, and so uh, what, if you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the message uh, because it's relevant to a lot of the things that I'm talking about today. I talked about how we're no longer bound by the Mosaic law. Uh, and, and Hebrews actually says the old covenant and is obsolete. We're not a part of it, but we can still learn from it. And the section that we're looking at today, it deals with the upcoming conquest of the land of Canaan for the Israelites. And to be clear, uh, this was also definitely a part of the Mosaic law that no longer applies to you and I in a direct sort of a one-to-one way anymore. Uh, But I still believe that there are some really great lessons that we can learn about how God does great things through ordinary people. So we're going to pray together And then we're going to read Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 33. Would you bow your head and your heart with me? Lord, we thank you that you are always working in our lives. Sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it seems big, but usually, Lord, it's just a small little thing that we need to do on that particular day. And so, God, I just pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see. I pray that you would open our ears today, that we would all hear what you want us to hear. And most importantly, God, open our hearts that we'd respond and become the disciples you want us to be as a result of having spent time together. And in your word, God's people say, amen. All right. Exodus 23, 20 says, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from among you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people whom, against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. And here's the key verse. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land 
And I will set your border from the Red Sea uh, to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you, shall ma- and you shall drive them out from before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Man, what a phenomenal little insight into how God promised the Israelites that they would conquer the promised land. God told them it's not going to happen all at once. It wasn't even going to happen in a year. God made sure to put that phrase in there. God said that it was going to happen little by little. And if you're an underliner, highlighter of your Bible, man, that verse 30 is one you want to put stars and circling all over it. Because I believe that the way that God achieves great things through his people has essentially always been the same. Little by little. One step at a time. One brick laid at a time. One page read at a a time, one page written at a time, one workout at a time, one devotional Bible study completed at a time, one hard shift put in at work at a time, one hard day endured with toddlers at a time. I'm saying that one for myself and my wife right now. (laughs) One counseling session at a time, one Sunday in church at a time. You get the point. It's little by little. And so whether you feel stuck in your life right now or or you feel like things are going relatively well, I hope today's message encourages you about God's plan for your life. And so what I have today are three encouraging reminders from Exodus 23 about how God does great things through ordinary people. When you came in, you should have received a note sheet You can also follow along at lovehopecity.com slash notes on your phone if you're at home or watching this wherever else you might be. And so the first thing I'd love for you to jot down about how God does great things through ordinary people is this. We need this little reminder. God is taking me to a place he has prepared for me. Sometimes we just need to say that to ourselves, that God is taking us to a place that he's prepared for us. God was specifically taking the Israelites to this location that he had designed for them. It was the land of Canaan. And all of Exodus had been building up the Israelites to this miraculous moment when they left Egypt. Uh, you know, they got through into the wilderness, but to specifically cross over into the promised land. Yet that moment would not be seen even by Moses' generation. They wound up dying off in the wilderness because of their disobedience and their lack of faith. Joshua, the next leader, would be the one who would pick up the torch and take them faithfully into the land that God had prepared for them. It didn't happen overnight. God said it wasn't even going to happen in a year. It would happen little by little. It happened one step of obedience at a time from the jaws of Pharaoh to the deserts of the wilderness to the crossing of the Jordan River. God was faithfully taking his people to the land that he had promised for them and the place that he had prepared for them. And I'm sure there were lots of times when the Israelites march in the desert did not feel like God was taking them to the land of milk and honey, but God was taking them to the place that he had prepared for them little by little. You know, some have suggested that the journey through the wilderness could have been accomplished in as little as 17 days. Now, I think that's definitely true for a smaller group of people who are seasoned hikers, but you have to remember that these were like a million Israelites. They had uh, children. They had older people. They had livestock. They had all of their belongings. Imagine if you were carting all your stuff through the mountains. It would take you and I a while to get through as well. Uh, So you can understand why it took longer. I doubt that they could have pulled it off in 17 days, but I'm sure nobody predicted that it would have taken 40 years to get into the land. And yet God was taking them to the place that he had prepared for them. I want to tell you, God is taking you to the place that he has specifically prepared for you little by little. You know, and like the Israelites, it often doesn't feel like God is taking us anywhere. Let me tell you a quick story from my own life about this. I remember graduating from college wondering where I was supposed to go next. I had become a Christian at this great church in San Diego, North County, and I always thought that that was where God would take me back to to work at when I was done with school. That was my dream for my life, I thought, at that point. But when I graduated, they weren't hiring at the time. Or maybe that's just what they told me because they didn't want to hire me. I don't know. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I looked around for other employment opportunities as we do when we start running out of options both outside the church and, and inside the Christian church. And one came up at a place that I never thought that I would associate with, let alone work at. And that was the Crystal Cathedral. And I had both theological as well as kind of like practical, pragmatic philosophy of ministry and stylistic differences. You know, they were this kind of traditional, positive thinking based church. And, and I became a Christian in like a Bible teaching, but yet cutting edge kind of a untraditional met in a warehouse kind of a church. And so the Crystal Cathedral did not seem like the place where I would fit in to put it lightly. But then I started to get to know the people. And as I got to know them, I learned an extremely valuable lesson. And the lesson that I learned is that you can't always trust what you read in a blog somewhere. How many of you have learned that story in your own life? You know, it turns out there's a lot of angry and disgruntled bloggers on the internet. Anybody figured that one out as well? <laughs> Even in the Christian community. And, and those folks have a lot of not so nice things to say about people who many times they've never even talked to or gotten to know them before. And so what I did was I set my church idealism and my church biases aside. And also I took the only job that was on the table at the time. <laughs> so I'm not gonna lie. It was somewhat driven by pragmatism, but I took a job at the Crystal Cathedral. And the whole time I was there, I, I could, I'd be lying to you if I was saying that everything was like, it jived perfectly with me. No, I constantly encountered things that I just like, oh man, that doesn't feel like true to who I am as a person and, and what I believe. And if I were leading, I would do X, Y, and Z differently. But man, I got to tell you, God taught me so many things there about leadership, about employment, about life, and about ministry. And one of the lessons that God taught me during that time is something that I like to talk about as the church 80. 20 rule. And here's what I mean by the church 80-20 rule. It's this principle that we're never ever going to find 100% uh, of the things we like in any single organization that we're a part of. Now, this is 100% true in a marriage, but please married people, no one say amen right now, okay? Um, <laughs> this is true in a job. This is definitely true in terms of the church that all of us attend. You know, I, I think that if we enjoy 80% of the things or more of what happens in a church that we belong to, it is an absolute dream church. It's a great situation. And I think it's safe to say that there will always be 20%, maybe a little less, uh, of things about any church that some of us shake our heads at a bit. Maybe we cringe here from time to time. And so God taught me that as long as the core of the theology was there. And what I mean by that is the gospel about Jesus Christ, uh, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. That the Bible is taught accurately. Uh, that there are practices that we can learn to think differently about, even if they might not be our number one preference. And so in terms of a church, I think of 80% or more, it jives with who you are in terms of practice. It's a great church. In terms of a paying job, my 80-20 rule is totally different. See, if you're in a paying job where you're paid to do something and you like more than 50% of it, I think it's a dream job. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Of course, there's aspects of it that you don't like to do. That's why they pay you to do it. If someone would just do it for free, they wouldn't be hiring you to make it happen. Thank you. You're my new favorite person in church right now. I, I, I love you. Um, you're like, we just met and he's telling me he loves me. This is kind of weird. Anyway, Love you, bro. We can bro out later. Of course, there are aspects of things that we don't like to do in a job. But back to the thing about church, you know, in the case of a church that we're involved in, man, if it's more than 80% on track with what you're looking for, it's an amazing thing that you get to be a part of. And the longer I served in the Crystal Cathedral and the more I learned about what they do, the more I fell in love with, I fell in love with what they did and the more I fell in love with the people that they served. And I liked the emphasis on professionalism. And I liked the emphasis on preparedness. And I even grew a taste for the traditional church. And I didn't even know that that was possible for me. 
I was like, wow, the choir did a great job today. I just said the choir did a great job today. Oh my gosh. Like, I, I didn't even grow up in an environment where there was. I didn't even know what a choir was until I went to the Crystal Cathedral. Um, and so God used that ministry to just show me that Christianity was so much broader than what I had grow, grew up experiencing before um, and to give me opportunities in lead, leadership. And most importantly, God used that ministry to prepare me for the place that he had was calling me to, and that was planting City Church. You know, it wasn't a perfect thing, especially at the end of all of it when I wound up leaving, but more than not, man, those people blessed me to plant this church. And not every church planter gets to experience that, by the way. And so here's what God was doing in my life during those four years I spent at the Crystal Cathedral. He was preparing me for the place that was ahead of me, the place that he had prepared for me. And so with all my heart, friends, I tell you, I would not be standing on this stage right here today if it was not for taking a job that I never thought I would associate with at the Crystal Cathedral. Like the old country song says, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Some of you are like, stick to preaching. <laughs> I used to do worship, I, but you know what? I didn't get that far with it, so now you know why I'm a preacher. <laughs> Let me remind you of something that you probably know, but it's good to hear it again sometimes. God is preparing you. He is taking you for, to a place that he has prepared for you. It might be a job. It might be parenthood. It might be a home that he has for you in your future. And that home might be your dream home with the two-car garage. It might not be. <laughs> but God is still taking you to a place that he specifically has in mind for you. And for some of you, God's taking you to a relationship that he's prepared for you. And man, you just need to be patient. Uh, you know, there is nothing quite quite as ugly, in my opinion, as desperation upon an individual. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like there are some people right here right now who are setting up dating profiles on every app like they're a spammer from another country, you know? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sure there are just as many horrible American internet spammers as those from other countries, but you get the point. The point that I'm trying to communicate is not that I'm against online dating, actually, because interestingly enough, most of the couples who I do weddings for today met online. It's like 60 to 75%. So I think it's great. The point that I'm getting at is sometimes we just get too antsy and, and it becomes obvious to everybody around us but us that we need to just settle down and trust in the Lord where we're at a little bit. So I believe with all my heart, if you are living an obedient life right now, wherever you find yourself in terms of everything God has set out in the Bible, man, you can rest. You can just trust that you are right where he wants you to be. You can trust that he is preparing you for the place that he has ahead of you. And there is nothing we can do to accelerate the timeline of God. If there's anything we have learned in 2020, 2021, it's that God's timetable is not ours. But resting and trusting in God doesn't also mean that we just sit back and we do, do, do nothing. It means that we keep obeying the instructions we've already been given until we receive new ones. And so today, I know for sure that I am right where I need to be in my own life, both here in the church, where we live. It's just like God has just set everything up, us, us up for in our lives for us to be here. And yet, even though I know that I'm right where God wants me to be, it is still helpful for me to remind myself that God is always working little by little every single day, that the church of Jesus Christ isn't built in a Sunday or even in four Sundays in a month or 52 in a year that the church church of Jesus Christ has been being built since Jesus rose from the grave. And I get to be a small part of that plan. You get to be a part of that plan for your life. You know how it happens? It doesn't happen all at once. What does the Bible say? Help me out. Little by little. And at the same time that I'm making the point that God is taking us to the place that he's prepared for us, I have to clarify one thing. You know, sometimes people worry that they've missed or they've messed up God's plan for their life. And I have really good news for you if that's you, wherever you find yourself. You and I are not capable of messing up God's plan. <laughs> We are not that strong, um, and it is not because we're so good or, 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 or anything like that. It's because God's so gracious. And so, I mean, man, think about Moses. 
Here's the guy who killed the guy and, and yet God still used him. Think about David. He, he slept with another man's wife when he had everything he could have or want to have in his life and then he had her husband killed to cover his tracks and yet God says, David's a man after my own heart. And so if you feel like you've missed the boat of God's plan for your life or you've messed it up too bad, badly, I promise you, you haven't. And God is taking you to the place that he has prepared for you. So here is the second encouraging reminder from Exodus 23 that I think all of us uh, could benefit to remind ourselves of. And this is it. God's protection and his provision depend upon the practices of his people. So God protected the Israelites so long as they continued to pay attention to him and they kept obeying him. In verses 20 and 21, we see that protection was promised in exchange for obedience. And so God sent this angel along the way to protect the Israelites and uh, to show them where they needed to go. But the Lord was clear that they needed to pay close attention to everything the angel said and they needed to do everything he asked them to do because God's name was in what the angel was doing and so they needed to remain obedient to him. In verse 25, we see that uh, the provision of bread and water were even promised in exchange for obedience. And then in verse 26, we see that God's protection for the Israelites even included their health. And God told them he was going to take away all their sickness. And God told them that, he, that none of the pregnant women would miscarry during this time. And God wanted to make sure the Israelites knew beyond a shadow of doubt that he would protect them so long as they continued to pay attention to and to obey him. Now, at this point in the message, this is where I have to remind us that this is a lot of Mosaic Covenant stuff that I don't believe applies to us in a direct one-to-one -one way in the same way that it applied to the Israelites at that time under that covenant. Um, in fact, I've known many Christians over the years who God has not healed, and yet the healing that God did was in their heart. You know, my wife and I went through many miscarriages in our marriage before uh, we wound up being able to conceive and have kids, and we felt like we were really being faithful to the Lord at that particular season in our lives. And so I believe we need to be careful giving folks struggling with sickness false hope that actually stems from a misunderstanding of which covenant Christians currently operate under. We are no longer under the Mosaic Covenant. We're under the new covenant in Christ's blood established on the cross. And I already mentioned it, but last week in Hebrews, we referenced that that covenant is obsolete, is what Hebrews tells us. Okay, so some of you are sitting here and you're thinking, okay, so what then does apply if it's not in a one-to-one -one direct way? Here's what I think. Even though it's not an every time and every place kind of a promise, the general principle that God protects us and that he provides for us as long as we continue to pay attention to him and to obey him, man, I believe that is as relevant to you and I today as ever. You know, provision might not always translate into wealth. Sometimes it does. Praise the Lord when that happens. Protection might not mean that you never ever get sick or you don't go through health challenges in your life. Protection could mean those things for some believers. Protection uh, could mean that God protects you from going into a really dark place as you're going through the trial. And those who are going through the same thing who don't know Jesus, they're in this dark place and you can say, hey, you know what? I'm going through this. We're in this together. But let me tell you where my my real hope is. It's not here. It's in heaven in the hope of the Lord. Um, and so what does it mean to pay attention to God so that the protection and, and his provision stay on our, in our lives? Well, I definitely think it means obedience. And I feel pretty confident in saying that every message that I've ever given uh, over the course of my years of ministry and hopefully every message I ever preach in the, my future will always include a sub, solid section in there about obedience. And the reason for that that is because, is because it is the one response that God wants from his people. When we commit our lives to him, God wants our worship and he wants our obedience for the rest of our lives. I believe paying attention to God uh, means fixing our eyes on Jesus in whatever trial it is that we're going through. Uh, you know, it says that as Jesus went to endure the cross in Hebrews, it says that he did it with joy 
in his heart because he fixed his eyes on his father. And, and think about that. He was about to be tortured. He was about to be killed. And yet he fixed his eyes on his father and he endured the cross with joy in his heart. Sometimes God will allow bad things to happen in our physical bodies because we live in a fallen world. But God will protect our hearts by giving us joy through the trial. You know, all this being said, I gotta say something else. I still believe God is our healer, amen. And sometimes our Western Christianity is so quick to dismiss healing today as well, that's something God did then or you know, maybe that's something God does in, in other countries but, but that's not something that God's still doing today. I mean, I'm not seeing it in my life today. Well, I believe with all my heart that God still heals people. He does it today. I've seen it. He, we were told we'd never have kids, we had less than a 1% chance and by the grace of the Lord, we have two. <laughs> He's our healer. And you know, sometimes God does it all at once, but you know what happens a lot of the time? Little by little. And so if you're here today and you're dealing with an infirmity of any kind, here's what I want to remind you of. Jesus is your healer. (laughs) Come to the cross today and what is true in terms of his ability to save our souls from uh, the darkness of separation from the Father is still true in terms of his ability to heal our bodies. And, and so the difference, in my opinion, between what we just read in Exodus, where there's this promise, it says, if you obey me, you're never going to get sick. The women aren't going to miscarry. The difference between, in my opinion, that kind of a, a covenantal system and what we're under today um, is, is simply this. See, our posture as as new covenant believers is that we have faith for healing. We ask for healing. We know who God is. We know he's the healer. But at the same time, Jesus modeled the most important four words that we could ever remember. Your will be done. God, if I'm supposed to, I want, Lord, you know I want a new job, but your will be done. God, God, you know that, that, my friend over here is sick and, and we're praying for her healing, Lord. And, and we have faith that you can do it, but Lord, your will be done. God, you know that I have some needs in my life right now. Lord, you know that I'm not exactly where I want to be. And, and Lord, the things that I'm wanting in my life may not even all be bad things, but Lord, your will be done. You know, at the same time, God's provision and, and, and his protection, it depends on our practices. And, and so our part is to pay attention to God in the process. Our part is to be faithful to what he's asked us to do that we know in the Bible. He said, listen, this is what a Christian life looks like. This is how you're supposed to lead your life today. And so it's so important if we wanna ask God for stuff, if we wanna think about how God works little by little, that we remind ourselves that his protection and his provision depend upon the practices of his people. Here's the third helpful reminder, reminder from Exodus 23 about how how God does great things through ordinary people. And man, I just hope this just sinks into your heart today. Keep plugging away. God's not done and something good is always coming around the corner. You know, verses 29 and 30 show us how God pushed the Israelites uh, into the promised land little by little, and he pushed the nations out little by little. And for the Israelites to go in, the nations needed to go out. Now, of course, we knew that God was capable of wiping out the nations with a solid sneeze, if that's what he wanted to do, which, by the way, is a great way to clear out a church building in 2021, right? Just have one solid sneeze in the room. Um, But listen, God also loved the nations who were in the land at that time and God wanted to give the nations an opportunity to come to hear about him and to repent uh, and so that they could come to know him. And so I believe that a part of the reason that God took his time driving out the nations from the land was to give the nations time to come into the kingdom of God because God's always been more interested in people than anything else. So God did it little by little. I believe that God pushes you and I through life's challenges little by little. Now here's a little bit of an ironic thing for all of us to think about today. You know, we all want God to move quickly in our lives, but when there's a sin thing in our life that God says shouldn't be there, we're often a lot slower to work on it. (laughs) 
and, and we're like, oh, you know, God, uh, give me that new car. You know, Lord, you, you know, I, I want to get through this challenge. God, I need that better job. God, promote me in my current job. God, give me that house that I want to own one day. God, put me on that platform. God, do this. God, do that. Bless here. Bless there. In Jesus' name, amen. And we go to bed. And then we get upset when things don't move so quickly, and yet we move so slowly with basic things that God said, I've given you the tools and the resources to actually have victory in some of these things in your life. So for the Christian, I believe with all my heart that good things are always ahead, little by little. You know, the picture in your life right now might not look so good, but God can help you take some steps today so that the picture looks a little better tomorrow. And God wasn't done with the Israelites. The promised land was just around the corner. God was encouraging them to keep plugging away. Little by little, they'd make it in. And God isn't done with you. Little by little, something good is coming around the corner in your life. What if I told you today that you might be one or two small yet consistent changes away from transforming your life in the next one to five years? It's been said that a waterfall begins with a single drop of water. Malcolm Gladwell says it takes an average of 10,000 hours for someone doing something to actually become proficient at it. It's been said that the journey of a thousand st uh, miles begins with a single, help me out, step. Um, you know, it's ancient battering rams were known to take a thousand hits before they could knock the doors of the castle down. And imagine if you get there and you start knocking. <laughs> after 50, your arms are getting tired and seems like you're not getting anywhere after 100 to 150. But to, by that thousandth hit, the doors finally break through. See, it's little by little that the promised lands of life get taken. We are all works in progress. I can't expect Nigel and Emerson to start doing the dishes just yet. <laughs> I can hardly get them to pick up their toys. <laughs> and so when I see them put one toy in the bin that it is actually supposed to go into, it's like, yes, you did it. We throw a party in our house. <laughs> Because I know that it's a little evidence of them maturing in the right direction to be the kind of people that uh, pick up after themselves, that learn to take care of the things that they're responsible for. It's little by little. Psalm 119, 105 reminds us that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I often like to remind you guys that when I share about that verse, that the ancient oil burning lamps, they didn't have, you know, the flashlights we do that illuminate a long ways away. It was only enough to illuminate a few steps that were right in front. And so the principle that God was getting at when he was saying uh, that was that when we open his word, God's not going to show you the whole picture, what he's going to tell you is the steps that you need to take that day. And so God knows that change happens incrementally for us all. Um, you know, sometimes we think we're ready for a blessing and we're praying for it and God's like, I know what you're really ready for and you're not there yet. And so God lets it just kind of play out a little slower sometimes in our lives. I love how the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 puts it. Uh, this is uh, putting it in, in spiritual terms, he says this, 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So what he's getting at is that we're all being transformed. Uh, I love that idea, from glory to greater glory through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to remind you to keep plugging away at whatever God has set in front of you. God is not done. Something as good is always coming in your life, little by little. And so this is a great point in the message for really all of us to ask ourselves this one simple question, and this is it. What little steps do I need to take or start taking today? For some of you, you know, the promised land that you're praying for is employment related, and, and some of you want, want clarity about what kind of job you're supposed to have one day, and you feel confused. And some of you are like, man, just give me any old job and I'll take it in Jesus' name. <laughs> Some of you are in a job and you want a different job. Some of you uh, keep hoping to get promoted within your current job and it just doesn't seem like anything's happening. Well, here's a thought. Get to know some people who are doing what you're hoping to do. 
ask them some questions, you know? What did it take for them to get there? What kind of training seminars or schooling did they have to go through? Uh, do they have anyone they know who's offering, you know, or hiring a, a position that you may be able to connect with in some way? Go to a headhunting firm. Take a step. For some of you, the promised land that you're praying for is possession or financially related. You might want to get out of debt. Uh, you might want to pay for college or pay off college that you've already paid for. Maybe you want to own a house one day. Uh, or maybe you want to build up your savings today so that you feel a little bit more secure where you are in your life. Start taking small and consistent steps and you will be amazed at what God can do over the next one to five years. It's not going to happen all at once, but little by little, the Lord is going to bless you. For some of you, the promised land that you're praying for may be health related. And so if that's you, you know, I just want to encourage you to research every fruit juice, every vitamin cocktail, every drug, every diet program, and every exercise routine that's out there. Try them all until you land on something that seems to be helping in your situation. And here's the deal. If you're doing everything you know how to do, and, and you can honestly say that you've tried everything you need to try, man, you can rest in knowing that God's going to do what he wants to do in your life. And that's where that surrender piece comes in, where we do everything we can do, and then we release it to God and say, now you do what only you can do. For some of you, the promised land that you're praying for is relationship related. Maybe you feel like you don't have any close friends or you don't have enough close friends. Maybe today even, reach out to some people here in the church, invite some folks to lunch and coffee, get to know them. Don't expect people to come to you um, and, and be the friend that you would wish someone else had and you watch God send you the friends that you're supposed to have. Some of you may want to be married someday and, and you don't even know where to start. I just want to encourage you to be who God wants you to be today and focus on that day in and day out. And I can't promise you that God has a spouse for you. I've heard uh, people who, uh, you know, will say, oh, if it's in your heart, 100%, it's from God. I, I think more often than not, it probably is. Uh, but I know folks who wanted to get married and never, uh, that just, that situation never worked out for them. But here's what I do know for you. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And whenever I preach on that verse, I always remind us that, uh, that we, as, to, as we delight ourselves in the Lord, his desires become our desires. And so really what happens is your desires change to become his desires. And so slowly but surely, God will give you the dire desires of your heart because your desires are his desires. And so whether or not those desires for your future mean a spouse or not, I don't know. But I know that we can rest when we're delighting in the Lord. For some of you, the marriage that you currently have is not where you would like it to be. And here's what I would encourage you with today, if that's you. Man, take a small step to being the spouse that you're supposed to be today. And you just focus on being the husband or the wife that you're supposed to be today. And you just keep doing that day in and day out, years on end and years on out. And you watch what God does in your marriage. For some of you, the promised land that you're praying for is maybe something more internal and heart related. Uh, you're worried about stuff that you shouldn't be worried about. And, and Jesus says, don't be anxious about tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So you just focus on today. Maybe some of you are having a hard time forgiving someone and Jesus will help you today to let it go. Galatians 6, 9 reminds us that we need to not grow weary in doing good and that if we remain faithful to what God has called us to do, that we will reap a harvest in due season. Friend, I just wanna encourage you, don't give up. Keep plugging away. God is not done. Something good is always coming up right around the corner, little by little. Let's pray. Lord, before we think about where we're not and where we want to be and the things ahead that we feel like we don't have, God, we have to thank you for what we have. <laughs> Lord, I don't even know how I'd be here without you. I'd be, I'd be gone. I'd be, I'd be dead, Lord. I, I'd, I'd be following my own desires. 
And so, Lord, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for our, our, our families. Lord, we thank you for this church. Uh, God, we thank you for the generosity of Christians to continue to pave a way so that a place like this can exist where the word of God is taught and where you are praised in worship so that we can continue to hear from you day in and day out. And Lord, as we surrender our futures into your hands, God, Give us a sense of what little by little means for today. And if you're in here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you genuinely were to walk out these doors and you don't know if you'd go to heaven, I believe with all my heart that God brought you here today to settle that question once and for all. I'm here to tell you God promises to forgive you of your sin to adopt you into his family, to fill you with his Holy Spirit, and to give you an eternal life. There's only one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so if you've been window shopping God and the Bible and the claims of Christianity, today is your day to step across the line and become a Jesus follower. And so if that's you, just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there. And I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Take over. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen.